Hello everyone, Jack number two here. Do you like science fiction? Are you interested in African culture? And can you handle the power of a female protagonist? If you enjoy any of these topics, then you will certainly enjoy the Binti Trilogy. But in this video, I want to mainly focus on the culture that surrounds the series and the genre that supports the culture. The Binti Trilogy is a series of three novellas. A novella is basically a longer short story. The first novella, Binti, only has 96 pages, but that doesn't stop it from being a good story. In fact, one of the reasons I really enjoyed the trilogy was because of its short length. Compared to Dune by Frank Herbert, which officially has a page count of 412, but the copy I own has 794, which can become a boring read due to its sheer length. So it was a nice change having an entire trilogy told in under 500 pages. Sorry, I'm getting off track. The trilogy consists of Binti, Binti Home, and Binti the Night Masquerade. The story follows a young intelligent woman, guess the name, who is the first of her people to be accepted into a prestigious institution called the Uzmaza University, which is on another planet. She eventually wants to seek knowledge of the universe and explore its endless opportunities, so she decided to leave her tribe, which was frowned upon. She sneaks on a ship heading towards the university, beginning her journey. I don't want to reveal any more of the story right now because I want to focus on the tribe Binti was raised in, the Himba tribe. In the series, the Himba are a human ethnic group on the planet Earth. They are closely inspired by the actual Himba people in our reality. The Himba, also known as the Ova Himba, are an indigenous group of people who live in northern Namibia, specifically the Kunin region. There is estimated to be around 50,000 living today. I think it's important to point out that a single Ova Himba is called a Amu Himba. An entire video is needed to explain their interesting backstory and unique culture, but I'll be going over some key points on how they live today, then compare them to their future selves as they are depicted in the Binti trilogy. The Ova Himba are known as a nomadic pastoralist. For those of you who don't know what a pastoralist is, they are basically sheep or cattle farmers. The Ova Himba breed fat tail sheep and goats, but breeding cattle, you could say, is a big priority. The cattle are important because they display a symbol of wealth. I also imagine their social reputation is determined by the number of cattle in their stock because wealth is usually associated with social power, but that's just a speculation. I pointed out that the Ova Himba are nomadic, but they are actually semi-nomadic. The Ova Himba travel to several destinations over the year, or years. They might even return to their previous spots around the country. I imagine they move around every so often because of the hot climate that dries up all the water for the tribe and their livestock. Also, if there is no food for their livestock, then they might have to move to a better patch of land that grows better grass. The Ova Himba are said to be one of the last nomadic tribes in Namibia. A presence of male dominance surrounds the culture. The tribe practices polygamy, allowing men to marry two wives. The life of their children is arranged at a young age. The father oversees finding a male partner suitable for his daughter. Once again, I think that social reputation plays a role because I believe that the father would want his daughter to marry a man with the most cattle, to gain social power and respect among the community. Again, this is just speculation. Both men and women in the group wear clothing that help withstand the hot semi-arid climate in northern Namidia, where barely any rainfall is present. The clothing is a simple piece of calf skin and sheep skin that is wrapped around their waist like a skirt. Different hairstyles and jewelry play a major role among the group, which indicates the age or social status within their community. Women who give birth wear a headpiece called the Urambi which is usually made from sheepskin and is used to represent a rite of passage in the community. Now if you haven't noticed throughout the video, the women in the Ova Himba group have a different look to them. That's because they cover their skin and hair with a paste known as Ochis, which is a mixture of butter fat made from their livestock's milk and ochre pigment, a natural clay. This process is used to cleanse the skin over a long period of time. It also protects them from the extremely hot and dry climate, as well as pesky insects. This paste gives their skin and hair a distinctive dark orange color that is very noticeable and has a natural beautiful look. 
Ojis is seen as a symbol of beauty and is a desirable aesthetic like makeup, tattoos, or piercings. I swear I couldn't find a single Amu Hembi man wearing or putting on Ojis pace. I guess that proves that the women of the Hemba tribe just want to have fun. Ha, uh, ha, uh, ha. Uh. Even after learning all that information about the Ova Hemba, I still feel like I know nothing about them. What are their wedding ceremonies like? Do they bury their dead? What do they do at night? Do they name their cattle? Do all the wives sleep in the same house? Do they read and write? Their world and life are so different from ours that it's almost like visiting another planet. And I would love to do that one day. So after learning about the real Himba tribe, what can we compare and contrast between the two tribes? To halt unnecessary confusion, I will name the Binti Trilogy's tribe the Himba tribe, and I will call the present day Our World tribe the Ova Himba tribe. I might have lost a few people, including myself, but I believe. Well, I think the most obvious difference is that the technology gap between the two is tremendously wide. The Himba tribe over the years have moved past the primitive nomadic lifestyle. That doesn't necessarily make them better than their real world counterpart, but it does show how far they have advanced as a tribe, and maybe one day the Uva Himba will achieve the same. The women from the Himba tribe still wear their Ajit's paste, similar to the Ova Himba women of today. Binti wears it even after leaving her home and brought some with her when she went on her new journey. I also believe I remember reading a description about the Himba jewelry and how it looks similar to the jewelry I showed earlier with the Ova Himba. But in my opinion, the biggest difference between them besides the technology gap is the fact that the Himba tribe chooses to stay away from the world and will not allow anyone from their tribe to leave without consequences even with access to space travel and their sophisticated technology. The Ova Himba tribe, on the other hand, are known to trade with outsiders frequently and are very friendly to travelers who decide to visit them. It seems the Himba tribe had completely abandoned their old beliefs and turned to new ones. I wonder if the Uva Himba will ever have that kind of change shake their culture. To be honest, I think the only similarities between the two tribes are the aesthetics. Binti still wears the Ojis paste on her body so that she will never forget her home and their customs, even though she could easily just get rid of them and find different beliefs in the new bigger world she had walked into. Just like the Himba had abandoned their affection to the outside world after their advancements in technology. Binti throughout the series desperately tries to hold on to her family's ways while learning new ones but she is constantly challenged by other people who do not respect her family's customs. And even when she returns home, her own family shames her for leaving the tribe. Benti is mentally trapped between both the world of her family and her new life at Uzma University. She wants both worlds to coexist and for them to open up with their customs and beliefs. But that is the big challenge for her character to overcome, and that is why I enjoyed her development not only as a character, but as a human being. Because at the end of the day, she just wants everyone to get along. I think that is it everyone. I don't think we need to go over anything or anyone else that is obviously super important to this entire video. We had a nice lesson with names I still have trouble pronouncing even after saying them a thousand times. We learned a little about the main female protagonist Binti and her struggle to cope with two worlds crashing at her doorstep. I made some horrible jokes, but I still feel something or someone is missing someone I should mention because she is super important to bringing understanding and knowledge about the super diverse and interesting African culture yes I see now I must talk about her her name it's it's Nadi Oxfor oh. Thanks, Nadi. Of course, how could I forget about the author to the Binti Trilogy? She is an incredible woman and has accomplished so much in her life, and I'm sure she will have plenty of more to show us as the years go by. So who is Nadi Okorafor? Well, her real name is Nadi Mia Nakamadiali Okorafor. Uh, sorry, Nadi. 
but she is a Nigerian American writer of science fiction and fantasy. She enjoys writing for adults and children, which is rare to see if you ask me. It's always nice to see authors explore different age groups and excel in both. She was born in Cincinnati, Ohio to two Nigerian parents who were in America to get an education. But unfortunately, they couldn't go back to Nigeria because of the Nigerian Civil War that happened around the time Nadi was born. She went to school here in America and eventually earned her master's degree in journalism from Michigan State, and then her master's degree and PhD in English from the University of Illinois in Chicago. In 2001, she graduated in the Clarence Writers Workshop in Lansing, Michigan. Then in 2015, Brittle Paper officially named her the African Literary Person of the Year. She has won nine awards, three of them were for her novella, Binti which you might have heard of, and was nominated for several more. And she has a neat fascination with insects. So yeah, I think she has a shorter list of achievements she hasn't accomplished as a writer, but I say give it another decade before she takes down Star Wars and forms her own science fiction world that will actually have good, interesting characters and isn't motivated by the money. Speaking of science fiction, that's what we should talk about because I think she has an interesting opinion on the genre of Afrofuturism. What is Afrofuturism? Well, according to everyone, Afrofuturism is a genre of entertainment that uses the frame of science fiction and fantasy to reimagine the African culture as an inspirational and technologically advanced society that holds a hopeful future. The most famous example right now that you have probably heard of is the movie Marvel's Black Panther. The movie earned over a billion dollars in the box office. Black Panther though has been around since the 60s and had a pretty good following and a really good reception over the years, but never got too much attention compared to the other big names. To be honest, he was one of my favorite superheroes growing up. I was more of a DC guy growing up, but Marvel definitely caught my attention with Black Panther. I never fancied Captain America and his shield and his leadership attitude. I definitely didn't fancy Iron Man because, you know, his superpower is being an asshole. But I remember watching the animated motion comic on BET back in the beginning of this decade. I loved his all black design and how it was based on a Black Panther, hence the name. But what really caught my attention was the fictional city of Wakanda. I won't deny, when I was little, I thought Africa was just a barren wasteland with crazy animals and a bunch of poor people. So when I saw this sophisticated city full of science fiction technology around every corner, it truly changed my perspective. Not only on the continent itself, but the culture that surrounded Wakanda and the characters of Black Panther. It just really was interesting. Did I still think Africa was a crazy place after? Yes. But I see why people are calling this genre a beacon of hope, especially for the black community. I hope hundreds and hundreds of kids are inspired to be like Black Panther, or any character in the Afrofuturism genre. Binti's story falls under that genre, but Nadi has a strong opinion on how the genre is being named. Afrofuturism isn't the correct way to say it according to her. She prefers the name African Futurism. And I couldn't agree anymore, but I'm going to try and one-up her. Not better, but not bad. Seriously though, calling it Afro instead of African kind of degrades the genre in my opinion. Afro isn't that bad to be honest, but when you want the writing community to take your work serious, you want to commit to a concrete word like African that has so much culture and history surrounding it rather than Afro, which is basically just a slang term for a hairstyle. I hope that didn't come off too harsh. But the majority of the population are already calling it Afrofuturism. But maybe when the genre evolves, the name might change. I just don't want big entertainment corporations to take this genre and mish it and mash it into this non-creative mess. Especially since Disney's got a head start with Black Panther making over a billion dollars. Which was a good thing to be honest because it got the name out there and it got the genre out there. But you know, those those guys only do it for the money. So just gotta watch out for that. Alright, my personal thoughts are coming out so I probably should shut it down before it gets too crazy. Well guys, it's been a good run. I got to introduce you to the Benti Trilogy. 
I hope I sparked your curiosity to check out more on the Himbad tribe. They really are a fascinating group of human beings. You got a good idea of who Nudei Okafor is and her potential future, but you definitely didn't learn how to pronounce her name correctly thanks to my horrible reading skills. I hope you all enjoy the video and have a good one. And to D, if you somehow see this video, I apologize for pronouncing your name wrong so, so, so many times. Thank you for the wonderful Binti trilogy.